So I want to talk today about a situation that's happening in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I'll talk about, a, a, it's a global phenomenon, but we're grappling with it currently in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'll talk about a specific site and some ideas I've had for how we might respond to the problem. But I, I have this funny role, um, because I come from the sciences and I work in design, of sometimes being the scientist and sometimes being the designer. So I'm going to show you some research work that is essentially science. Um, and what's funny for me is that I do this kind of research work for almost no money. The project you're going to see we did for about $5,000. And normally you would get a grant for $500,000 to be able to do this kind of work. But I do it with master's students instead of with doctoral students. So that makes it a lot cheaper. <laughs> so we've learned how to do things on small amounts of money. Um, and that's been really important because we're working with issues that are important to the public. So I feel a sense of urgency about a lot of these things. And I'm glad that we can do it without waiting and waiting and waiting to get financial support. So the reason why I feel a sense of urgency um, and why I put the idea of design for a new planet on my talk is because we all know that carbon dioxide emissions have gotten to the point where we haven't seen the kind of planet that we're on right now. Well, we as homo sapiens have never seen the planet that we're on right now. Humanoids existed before us, but not homo sapiens. So we're now in a situation that we as our species have never lived through before. And I think that's really important to think about that. And of course, cities are only as recent as five to 7,000 years. I have a slide about that just mentions how sea level has been rising since the last glacial period. Here's where the calling card of being a geologist comes from. When your slides go back 24,000 years, your time series. But in that time series, these data from all over the world show the different rates that sea level has risen by over that long period since the last glacial maximum. And um, you can see Meltwater Pulse 1A is one that people talk about as the nightmare version of what could happen next, where sea levels rose very rapidly for a period of time, leveled off, rapid, leveled off, rapid. And then since um, about 10,000 years ago, in the beginning of what we call the Holocene period, we've seen a very slow rise in sea level to the point where the world's deltas formed because that conveyor belt of sand and silt coming down rivers was dumping all that material in one spot, like a line of dump trucks just dumping everything in one spot for the last 10,000 years. And as sea level is rising, of course, all of that is going to change. And we have formed cities on those deltas, the very deltas that were created by a stable sea level position because the groundwater was high and it was good to grow crops there. There was often annual flooding, like the classic Nile Delta flooding. Um, and that helped people figure out how to do irrigation and grow crops. So we have extensive urbanization in the very areas that are most vulnerable to what's coming next. The state of California has tried to give guidance to its cities and public agencies about what kind of sea level rise we should anticipate. And um, they have said with a kind of, in a strategic context, if you're building something inexpensive and temporary, you can imagine as little as one meter by 2100. And uh, that would be something closer to half a meter by um, 2054 or 2060. So half a meter by 2060. And that's going to be an interesting number as we talk about what's going to happen with half a meter of sea level rise in the region that I'm working in, San Francisco Bay. And then if you're dealing with, you're planning something that's going to be permanent, that, you know, like a, a new highway or a new sewage treatment plant or a new urban neighborhood, that you're supposed to consider two to three meters of sea level rise, which is a lot. When you look at a flat landscape next to the ocean, that has a huge impact. So I'm looking at a flat landscape next to the ocean. And this is a wetland area next to a highway and a railroad line. And this is the San Francisco Bay on the right side. And this wetland is a Superfund site, which in the United States means that 
money from the petroleum industry, a tax on the petroleum industry was used to pay for some of the cleanup. But these sites haven't really been fully cleaned up. In fact, many of them are not cleaned up at all, even after 30 years, 40 years since they were identified, because the private owners of these sites have had so many lawsuits with the government and negotiations back and forth between attorneys about what would constitute enough cleanup that very little cleanup has happened. So this site has chromium-6, which is a hexavalent chromium. If anybody has seen the movie Aaron Brockovich, that's the contaminant that was in, featured in that film that was very cancer-causing. Um, benzene, also a big carcinogen. PCBs, <coughs> PAHs, those are from batteries and from um, oil and gas and then lead and mercury. So it's a highly contaminated site, even though it looks pretty innocuous. It's described as capped, but it's capped with soil and vegetation, which is not a real cap. Real caps are supposed to be impervious to water movement through them, at least 90% of it. But this is not a real cap in that sense. And I wanted to show you what's uh, going to happen as sea level rises to that site. So. Now this red outline shows that approximately the same area of that particular site. And that's one foot or about 30 centimeters of sea level rise. And you can see the water is coming up onto the site from the southeast. And that's two feet or 60 centimeters. Now the water has come to the interior of the site where some of the deposits are of some of the most cancer causing materials. Um, and that, I think, is really interesting because at three feet, uh, it shows that the whole site has been breached. And at only one feet, one foot, we start to see 30 centimeters, centimeters we start to see um, water going onto that so-called soil and vegetation cap. And that means that the contaminants will start to move into the marshes around this part of the nearshore environment. And once those contaminants get out into the nearshore environment in the sediment and move with the tides, then they become very widespread in this kind of embayment here. So we should expect to see a decline in biodiversity. Uh, we already see animals here in the marsh, Stege Marsh, that a fish that lives in the mud, it's called a mud sucker, and it has both male and female anatomical parts, and it has tumors throughout its major organs. So we already know that there are biological impacts of all the contamination that exists in these places. And I'm actually going to talk about some of that shoreline over there to left uh, as an example in more detail. There's also a neighborhood of low-income people, um, Latino people, African-American people, and retired Caucasian people who live in that neighborhood behind there. And as sea level rises uh, and the water comes onto the site and goes underneath the highway and underneath the railroad tracks, then they face exposure risks also. So that's the kind of situation that I'm looking at. This is actually something people know about, where the sea itself is going to come on to these contaminated sites. So because everyone already knows about that, that's not the big hot topic for me. I'm trying to push the boundary to talk about other things. This is a diagram from uh, the Rotterdam Water Plan from 2009. And it shows that they were thinking, I mean, of course, the Dutch know all about groundwater. They make policy about groundwater uh, and have for 100 years. But that uh, flooding comes from rain, from sea level rising, from rain coming down the river from far away, miles and miles away, and from rising groundwater. And that's really what I think is the piece that people don't understand in countries where groundwater is not managed. The Dutch have so much management of their groundwater that I think of it as like a domesticated groundwater. In the US, we, have, we don't even know where our groundwater is. We don't know how deep it is. We don't know what's in it. It's kind of like a wild groundwater. You have no idea where it's going to be at any particular moment. And no one makes maps of it because it's not considered a resource. It's typically polluted. You can't use it for drinking water. So this is what started to happen. We're starting on the San Francisco Bay Edge to get groundwater coming up through our storm drains and causing spot flooding at high tide. So this is a, an extra high tide. And water comes right up like a little fountain through holes in the maintenance cover 
on the storm sewer system. Seaweed comes up with it because it's ocean water coming up through these pipes. And if I have tasted that, and it's salty. So it's definitely salt water. The issue is most people in California don't understand what groundwater really is. We usually talk about it as something that we don't have enough of. Because in much of California, it's being used for irrigating crops, and it's going down. Also in Beijing and many other places around the world, groundwater is being overused, and so it's sinking and actually causing the land to sink with it. But I'm talking about the very shallow groundwater that if you dig down in the sand at the beach, like these kids are, that's what you would find in the sand. It's fresh water moving towards the ocean. And over time, it becomes salty as the sea rises. But it's, it's not confined under rock layers, like the clean groundwater that we try to use for drinking and irrigation. It's loose, and it just fills the spaces between <coughs> tiny grains in the soil. So we also call it the saturated zone. It's, and it rises and falls freely. In fact, it rises and falls with the tide, not as fast as the tide because there's friction. Um, and this is what our US Geological Survey uses to represent that, that there's salt water under the sea and under the land in the ground. And it's like its, its toe is underneath the land, and it kind of pushes the fresh water up like a toe under a pillow on the sofa. And as that pressure increases, because sea level is rising and generating more pressure, we're going to see the freshwater water table come up also, still flowing towards the ocean, but rising freely in the soil. It's just the way an equilibrium gets reestablished. So it's basic physics. I'm not inventing any geological knowledge here. So what's going to happen as the sea rises, most of us are imagining the sea coming onto the land. But what's really going to happen is that water is going to come up through the ground, that fresh water. And the first things that are going to happen are underground, which is hard for the public to visualize. It's actually hard for most designers to visualize what's in that three-dimensional volume um, under the surface of the land. So this dark blue represents uh, salty groundwater, and the light blue, a fresh groundwater, a sewer pipe, a road, a levee, a dry creek bed, because this is California, and um, soil pollution underneath that paving surface as a cap. And as the sea rises, the dark blue is going to rise on the marsh that we build or have restored on the edges of our shoreline. It's going to start to fill the sewer pipes. Because when those get inundated, if they're cracked at the joints, and I can tell you almost all American sewer pipes are cracked at the joints because we don't maintain them very well, uh, they fill with water. And then that pipe is no longer available to carry away stormwater or to carry away human waste. When the pipe is full of groundwater, people's toilets will start to back up. The pipes will back up into the basements of houses um, and stormwater won't drain away when it rains. So this is going to be a big impact on the underground infrastructure that we already have. The creek beds will start to have more water in them, um, which could be good at first. And the contamination that's under a cap in the soil, cancer-causing chemicals like benzene and metals, uh, as they get inundated, they'll change. So benzene will start to turn to methane, and we'll get more methane gas, which is explosive, and hydrogen sulfide, which is another breakdown product of methane. And metals um, can start to mobilize, move around, that were otherwise attached to little bits of sand in the soil, like arsenic, will start to move around in the groundwater. And that's going to be very dangerous. As the, as the flooding continues, as the sea level continues to rise, Flooding will occur behind the levee on the road, which is the low point, typically. Um, the levee makes no difference at all to this phenomenon. And this is something that a lot of designers don't understand. I see so many sections that have levees in them for new housing developments that are going to be next to the ocean. Uh, but the levee won't make any difference to this at all. It'll stop waves from coming onto the land, but it won't stop the groundwater from rising. So we could spend billions of dollars on levees that don't prevent flooding. And the only way you could it would be if you would pump on the inside of the levee, which is what the Dutch do. That's where you get windmills. 
Um, but if we do that in California, we'll start to get land subsidence and we'll end up with land below sea level faster. And the last thing you want to give up at this point in time is elevation. You don't want land to subside because your flooding problem just gets worse. So these are just some quick illustrations of places where this kind of thing is already happening, where water comes up through the drains. This is water in New Zealand coming up through a drain. And this woman is trying to clear leaves out of her storm inlet to get that puddle to go away. But it's not, that's not the problem. The problem is it's coming up. It's the ocean coming up onto the street from below. So no amount of cleaning out that drain is going to help. And then the other risk in our region in the Pacific uh, rim of fire is that when there's a high water table in silty soil and even uh, mixed sandy soil or urban fill, when the earthquake energy wave comes through, which it will someday, this is what happened in Christchurch, um, the soil behaves like a liquid, like jello. And vehicles and can drop into it. And then a few seconds later, it turns back to a solid and they have to be dug out. So this is a phenomenon we expect to see in the um, San Francisco Bay Area. When our earthquake happens, we're now waiting for an 8.5 magnitude quake, which is increasing in probability every year. And we're very likely to see it in the next 20 to 30 years. And as our groundwater rises, this becomes more of a hazard. The area that could be affected by liquefaction expands. And the extreme potential for liquefaction increases. So you can see it's a complicated set of things all happening underground. And this is before anybody sees anything on the surface except maybe some puddles. So we're going to have to understand the environment enough to interpret what is happening here. Puddles with seaweed in them, that is a bad sign, really bad sign. So people are trying to do studies modeling um, to figure out how far inland this impact is going to extend with our wild, undocumented groundwater. And this one was done by the US Geological Survey. And it showed that it could extend as far inland as 4.8 kilometers. That's pretty far. Not at the same uh, level. So this is in feet. Three feet of sea level rise is shown at the bottom with that first blue line. And then the groundwater is only rising half a foot, six inches, uh, more than 10 centimeters, but maybe something like 15 centimeters as it goes inland. So it has less of an impact as it goes farther inland, but still enough of an impact that it could affect contaminants and pipes, all the things that are buried at two meters or a meter and a half below the surface. This is a map of Hawaii, of Honolulu, in Hawaii. And the top map shows uh, how much flooding they expect in Honolulu from one meter of sea level rise. And the bottom map shows how much area they expect to flood if they also consider rising groundwater, which, you know, that's not an optional thing. <laughs> Nature is going to consider rising groundwater so that the bottom image is more likely to be what happens. And the top one is what people have been planning for. So we're having to wake up to this situation and start asking ourselves well, what's going to happen in different places. So we did a study in the San Francisco Bay Area trying to figure out how much groundwater, well, first, where is the groundwater? How deep is it? And we used existing well data. We added a bunch of tidal datum points to that well data. And we looked at those data. So here's the surface of the land, and here's the level of the groundwater in all these different wells that the state has been monitoring because they're adjacent to contaminated sites. We have a big database of well data for contaminated areas. So that means we have more data in the city than we have in the agricultural landscape. We have a lot of data where the most people are, which is a good thing. And then we just made an interpolation among those points, which is a good way to get a first approximation. It's not based on processes. So I know it's not the right answer, but it's a good first approximation to identify where the hot spots might be of shallow groundwater. And the, there were many hot spots. In the red are the areas that are within one meter, or the groundwater is within one meter of the surface. The threshold for that liquefaction phenomenon I showed you is about three meters. So already, a very large area would be affected in an earthquake, a big earthquake. And then uh, the orange is one to two meters. 
and that's still shallow enough to be influencing pipes. So we have a lot of um, shallow groundwater in the area, and we didn't have data for those agricultural regions up in the north. That's why that's got that black check. And if you zoom into a particular area, this is the city of Oakland, and Alameda is that island. And again, the um, hatch marks are the areas where we weren't confident that we had enough data to say what was happening there. The black areas are where it looks in our maps as if the groundwater should already be at the surface. But that's because we're looking at a static groundwater table with that interpolation method. And in the real world, if water comes up to the surface, it flows off. So that groundwater is actually flowing out to the ocean. It's not like ice. It's not frozen at a certain level. So in fact, those black areas, the water's not at the surface. But it would be if you built a levee. So those black areas are places where we would already have emergent groundwater in the wet season if we built a levee. And if we look at it from a socioeconomic perspective, this is that same area. Now just looking at the city of Oakland, there's that island of Alameda again. And these red areas are, were subjected to what we call redlining in the 1930s to the 1960s where um, banks wouldn't give loans to buy homes in those areas because there were too many people who had brown skin. And that was a private sector policy that the government allowed to happen. Um, so people who lived in those areas worked in factories. This is also the red area is a lot of factory zones uh, and port activities. And they had to rent because they weren't given, they wouldn't get a loan to be able to buy a home. So they didn't gain income, they didn't gain wealth over the last 70 years, those families, because they weren't able to benefit from rising real estate prices because they were renters in a culture that really believes it's important to own. And those black circles show the areas where the groundwater is very shallow. So you can see that the people who are most at risk of the um, groundwater rising and moving poisons around are the people who were trapped in these areas by racist housing policies between the 1930s and you know really today. So that's really important to know and to realize that that's who's at risk. The people who have suffered the most already are the people who are going to suffer the most with this phenomenon too. Now there are more wealthy people also moving into that area and displacing those people. They have to move you know, 100 miles away to a different city now because there's no place they can afford. So now we're looking at the question of how do we figure out where this is most likely to happen? We know where our groundwater is already shallow, and that's a decent answer to the question by itself. If it's already shallow now, it's probably going to have problems in the future. But when we tried to get the state agencies that manage the contaminated sites to stop putting housing on those sites, they said, oh, well, you know where the groundwater is now, but that's not where it's going to be in the future. What if it doesn't rise on those sites? So we then had to get into this conversation about, well, how do we know where it's going to rise? And what we're interested in is this red and orange with the arrows shows uh, contamination that's already in the soil that has not been cleaned up. And the arrow just shows that it's moving down towards the water table. And some of it, in the case of situation one, is already in the groundwater. There are many sites like that where the pollution is already in the groundwater and moving towards the bay. And then there's situation two where it's not yet in the groundwater, but the groundwater could rise enough that then it will be. And then there's condition three where even if groundwater rises, it won't get high enough to affect the pollutants, the poisons in the soil under those sites. So what we were really interested in was conditions one and two. How could we figure out where that could be? Where would that be on the map? So luckily, um, as I've been working on this since 2017, I've gotten a lot of people excited about it, researchers. And the US Geological Survey got excited about doing some maps. And they made a coarse, kind of low resolution map of where groundwater is rising for the whole state of California, including the San Francisco Bay. But it's low resolution. So again, the state agencies can kind of dismiss it because they say, oh, that's a 10 meter cell size. So you know that's not very high resolution. <laughs> There's always some reason why it's not going to be accepted. 
even from the US Geological Survey, which is the, the authority on everything under the ground in the United States. So these white and blue zones show where the groundwater is projected to rise by at least 10 centimeters by 2100, with one meter of sea level rise. So where, I don't know when that'll happen, but by one meter of sea level rise, we don't really know what year. And we have just completed the research that shows that there are almost 3,000 polluted soil sites that are in the zone close to the water table where the water table is rising. That's a lot. 3,000 is more than I expected. I expected 500. So it's a much bigger problem than, than we expected, even I. And I've kind of been talking about this and getting, getting everyone excited about it for years now. And what's interesting in the data was is that the, um, with a half a meter of sea level rise, most of those sites are affected. A small additional increment of sites is affected as it goes to one meter. So remember I said 2060 is the year the state is asking us to think about as the, you know, the latest time when sea level might reach a half a meter higher than it is now, 2060 about. So this is the 2060 condition in the blue where I think it's um, 2,500 sites could be affected. And that means the health of the San Francisco Bay is at stake, and it means the health of the people who live around the bay is at stake. So let me give you an example of what this looks like on the site scale, and then I'll briefly uh, suggest what we're thinking about as ways to um, address this. This is a site that was um, a chemical manufacturing site Stauffer Chemical, and they made everything, every toxic thing, from gunpowder to pesticides and herbicides to they experimented with uranium in furnaces on that site. I mean, California was one of the centers of the nuclear U.S. atomic program, so everybody got a little uranium to try some pet experiment, <laughs> probably from the University of California. And this site is very polluted now. And it was sold to AstraZeneca sometime in the 1980s. At that time, it was just Zeneca. Um, and you know who AstraZeneca is. Of course, now they're a very wealthy company that has made a lot of money off of the COVID-19 vaccines. So it's not a poor company for which we feel sorry. <laughs> uh, this is the site outlined in blue on this map. And it has all of these chemicals all of these metals, selenium, uranium, zinc, lead, beryllium, arsenic, it has all the volatile organic compounds and all these organic chemicals that are pesticides that don't break down. Uranium is gonna go away faster than all of those things in the middle column. Those are persistent organic, persistent organic pollutants or POPs. And we don't, we don't even manufacture them anymore because we have this convention, the Stockholm Convention, that said you can't make those anymore. So. These are terrible things. <laughs> and then on the right column, all of these um, things that end in E-N-E, -E, the zines, uh, they have a gas component. And that's important and special because I'll show you in a minute how that's going to affect things. This, I'm sorry, it's low res. I haven't been able to find the original of this plan. But what's planned for that site is 4,000 units of low-income housing on that site that has all those contaminants. And they're doing a little surgery of removing some of the worst of it, but they're leaving most of it in place. And their logic is that that site is a mound. It's about um, three meters high. So when they look at sea level rise, it looks fine. But when they think about it in terms of groundwater rising into all the poisons in the mound, then they would realize that it's you know, very toxic. The mayor of this town um, wants to see a lot of new housing happen. Everybody in California wants to see new housing happen. We're in a housing crisis. There are people everywhere camping on the streets. But this is not a site that should be developed for housing while it's this dirty. It should be cleaned up. So it's in a context of other sites. There's that site now in a red outline. And then all of these sites around it are also contaminated. And I'm not showing the boundary of the contamination. Those would overlap and blur. I'm just showing the street address of all of those locations. So this is the Superfund site that I started talking about here. 
This is the AstraZeneca site that's going to get the 4,000 units of housing on it. This area already has fairly expensive market rate housing. All around here, the Marina Townhouses area. This property is owned by the University of California. And there was a plan to make it a global campus and invite students from all over the world to come and do research at that site. And to do that, they were going to clean it up. They are going to take all of the contaminated soil out and treat it or send it to Utah, whatever was cheaper. <laughs> They've sent a lot to Utah already. Um, but this was going to be part of this global campus. So they knew what it was going to cost. They had already established a cost estimate for removing the contaminated soil. It was about $127 million. That's not that bad when you consider the federal government would have given most of the money to do that. Or they could have made AstraZeneca pay. But instead, they're now talking about this 4,000 units of housing without removing more than a few tons of contaminated soil. So the site will remain contaminated. Once it has houses on it, there's nothing we'll be able to do except take the houses down to try to remove that contaminated soil. So it's like closing the box and hoping that nothing happens. Of course, something will happen. From a geological perspective, there's that red boundary again of the AstraZeneca site. It's at the end of these fingers of um, paleo channels. There used to be a river that would come down there, and now that river has moved to the north. But these channels are all in place. They're still gravel. And that means groundwater flows faster through those gravels towards the sea. So it's like there are not exactly fire hoses, but there's a preferential groundwater movement there, like as if it's a pipe discharging water to the Zeneca site. So it's a very bad spot to have all those contaminants. And underground, these are the sewer pipes that are still remaining in that area that will be used by the 4,000 units of housing. Those sewer pipes are within a meter and a half of the surface. And when a vol volatile organic chemical like benzene travels towards them on the water table, it, it'll be on top because it's lighter than water. That gas component, when the benzene enters this pipe, the liquid component is going to go down the pipe to the sewage treatment plant. But the gas component is going to rise. And it's going to rise into all of the buildings that are connected to these sewer pipes. So that's how people are going to be exposed to these contaminants, not in the groundwater directly, but through these pipes. And I had a fight with the mayor at a city council meeting. It was all recorded. It was all on Zoom. And he, uh, I said, I just told about this. This is a phenomenon that happens. I'm not inventing this. This is something that's been very well documented in other places, that gas contaminants come up sewer pipes into buildings. And that can happen at the base of the toilet, where the toilet has a, a seal. If that cracks or gets moved as the house ages and settles, um, the gas comes into the house. And the mayor came after me, interrupted me, and said, you may have a PhD from Harvard, but I find it really interesting that you don't understand how a toilet works. <laughs> now, the mayor's name is Butt. <laughs> Tom Butt. And he comes after me about how a toilet works. Because he's saying, well, a toilet has a, a gas, it has a P-trap is the word in English, where it's this little S shirt or P-shaped thing that has fluid in it, has water in it. And so gas can't come up through the toilet into the house. Yeah, but that's internal to the toilet. That's not below the floor. So the way that the gas comes in is below this P-trap. I can't believe this is what it comes down to in your professional life. You know? You're fighting with a mayor on a public meeting recorded on Zoom for all of posterity about how a toilet works. And then he sent out an email to his entire city of Richmond email list telling them that Christina Hill has a PhD from Harvard, but she doesn't know how toilets work. So he tried to embarrass me. And I just thought, well, that is it. I'm going to focus on this site for the next 10 years of my career. And I'm going to bring every newspaper person and TV person to this site. I'm going to get that guy. And he is under investigation for corruption, four different investigations, because he's an architect who wants to see these houses built and somehow is involved with the companies that are building the projects. He stands to make a profit himself 
So we're starting to make these visualizations where all the monitoring wells are these colored dots and we're showing the levels of contamination measured in those wells and that red line, that shows that over time the, um, the concentration of tetrachloroethene, which is oddly called PCE, and uh, tetrachloroethene, ethylene, is one of a cancer-causing group of chemicals. And it's obviously increased. And the threshold for residential development is that yellow line down on the bottom. So it's way above the threshold for residential development. And they'll take some of that out of the soil in a kind of surgical way, but not much. So it's going to be there. And no one ever gets to see this data because it's buried in the 150 append 150 page appendix of a 2,000 page document that's in PDF form. It's not an ex a spreadsheet, it's a PDF, and nobody in their right mind reads those PDF files. 2,000 pages to get to these graphs like this at the very end. So we're trying to make a visualization tool that's using GIS to help people see what's going on over time, and then to help them see how these contaminants flow so uh, we identified the areas that have the highest amount of contamination on this Zeneca site, those red circles. They should look like pox. And then we were working with one of the residents. Uh, she actually has a business, Sherry Paget. She has a business right there in that red rectangle next to the Zeneca sites. That's the Zeneca site above. And these dashed lines are contours, but not of topography, of groundwater surface. Mm -hmm. So we're showing how contaminants are going to flow on that groundwater surface. You do it just like you would with topography. You just draw the flow lines on the contours, 90 degrees to the contour. Sherry has had multiple tumors throughout her body and has had, you know, has had to have sections of her ribs removed, has had multiple surgeries. Um, she's clearly been affected by something and her building is attached to these sewer lines that I was talking about. So I'm gonna show you the larger context this is the Zeneca site, that big plinth, that big flat uh, light gray area. There's the bay. There's the University of California site above it. And here's Sherry's business down here in this block. And these are two different representations of the groundwater surface. The red one is local data taken from the many, many monitoring wells on that site itself. And the purple one is the US Geological Survey data that's very low resolution, 10 meter cells, which the, public, the state agencies are saying, well, that's you know, too coarse. We can't tell what's happening. So we're trying to show them that if you map the flow lines, this, these are the flow lines that go past Sherry Paget's workplace um, from the high resolution local data. There is no higher resolution data than that. And you can see it goes right through the block there so it's passing through and around all of those sewer lines. They've never shown this. They've never made a map that shows the flow lines for these contaminants. They just publish all the data in very technical looking tables. This is where those lines go if you look at the low resolution USGS data. It's a little different. Let me toggle back and forth for a second. And the brown lines are the sewer pipes. So that's the high resolution, that's the low resolution. It does look in the low resolution like more of the pollutants would go straight out to the bay without hitting the sewer lines. And in the high resolution, it actually looks worse. You can see that there could be more lines that would go past the sewer lines and under Sherry's business. But the fact is they're pretty similar. And I feel encouraged by this kind of result that we can use that low resolution USGS data to figure out at least 60%, 70% of where things are going. It'll have uncertainty associated with it, but it's gonna be something we can use because I can't do this kind of mapping for 3,000 sites. So what could we do about this? I mean, you know, we're designers, we're planners, we're people who are thinking about what to do, not just saying, it's awful, it's awful. So we're talking about strategies for what to do and we're looking at um, Dutch cities like Almere or Amsterdam and looking at both floating solutions and buildings that would be built in artificial ponds on pile foundations. 
But because we're going to have earthquakes, those pile foundations would be very expensive for us. They have to go really deep. So you'd have to build a taller building, at least a mid-rise building, to be able to afford those deeper foundations. For something at a lower density like this, we would really have to choose the floating option. And there are good examples from Amsterdam now, a development called Steiger Island, maybe some of you have seen, that has a potential density. It's not this dense, but it could be as dense as about 70 units per acre. Sorry, that's how we would talk about it, but um, it could be fairly dense, what we would think of as medium density in the United States. Not high density, but medium density. And all of our densities are scaled down compared to European and uh, certainly Asian densities are much higher. But this is the kind of thing that we're now talking about. We won a competition um, in the Bay Area to talk about adaptation strategies. And it was to uh, build an artificial pond so that the groundwater is expressed and then put some mid-rise buildings, I don't think these would be tall enough, but mid-rise buildings with deep foundations, and then floating up to three-story buildings in the pond. And we would do that with prefabricated units that are on shared decking. So unlike the Dutch model where it's kind of a houseboat, these would be stacked on decking with the pontoons underneath the decking, like a snowshoe. So it would get more buoyancy from that, and you'd get some public spaces on the water. So that's what we're proposing. And because it's a good earthquake strategy, it's something that people are beginning to take seriously. Uh, there are a number of different loopholes and laws about environmental stuff that we can probably get through with these ideas. So it has potential from a regulatory point of view also. And the bigger picture idea, and this is where I'll end, is um, again, a little bit low resolution, sorry, but is to think about those ponds. So the purple is the decking with the stacked units on them, the snowshoes. The green is wetlands, and the rest of it is um, graded earth. It's just moving dirt around to make levees around these ponds. Some of the ponds could be recreation. Some of them could be habitat. Some of them could be human housing. But over time, you would have to go um, inland, dig new ponds, and use that excavated material to refill the old ponds and make them wetlands. So it's like you're rolling up a carpet as you move inland, moving this strategy in managed phases that, if we're lucky, could be 50 years long. You could have a good 50-year run of living in that pond. And then as the water eventually gets too high with, let's say, a meter and a half or two meters of sea level rise, you'd have to build a new band of ponds farther inland and then fill up the old ones, because otherwise the wetlands will be gone as the sea continues to rise, we'll lose our marshes that are critical for our biodiversity. So that's the plan, basically. The strategy is to keep moving inland and to use that as a way to have stable periods for public and private investment, and eventually to be out of the way, and certainly hope that sea level rise will start to decelerate, will start to slow down if we can stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere. And if we can't, then of course we'll eventually have to get out of this zone of a high water table and move farther inland. But the strategy is to have some certainty for investment by the private and public sector over time. And not just have a bunch of conventional buildings that get damaged in floods or damaged in a big earthquake, um, but actually plan ahead. And the United States is not strong on this, so it's possible that that will not work. But that's a rational proposal. And uh, it seems like the kind of thing that tech people would like to live in. Um, we'd also like to make it something that's affordable. The, the Steiger Island project, the first half of that was done as an affordable housing development. So that's a model that we'd like to try to use and probably mix incomes. So that's where I'll stop. I just wanted to give you the big picture of the phenomenon, what is coming at the shoreline. What the problem is about what's coming, and then um, give you a sense of how we might do things differently. Thank you.